Hello, everyone. Welcome back to OTD Military History for our second live stream in a row. Yesterday, we had Chris Camfield on talking about the Archer self propelled gun uh, for part two. So that was pretty cool. Uh, if you haven't seen that yet, I highly suggest going to check that out after we're done here today because it really wraps up um, literally some questions people had and, and kind of bring that narrative together. And we talked about um, parts of Operation Veritable, which was always good to finish that up. So today we are shifting our focus to another part of the Second World War. Today we are looking at basically First Canadian Army and the Channel Ports. Um, obviously not an unknown campaign, but not one particularly in Canadian circles, I guess you could say, that's fairly uh, as well known as some others. So we have Dave Patterson on again today, who has been on, I don't even know how many times now, a few. Uh, so he's prepared uh, a good slideshow, and we're going to be using um, one of the maps that is created by Project 44 uh, that I did help work on. Uh, so we'll see that as we move along. So other than that, uh, let's get her going. Hey, Dave, thanks for uh, coming back on the channel again. I really appreciate it. Good afternoon. And happy, happy St. Patrick's Day to those who celebrate. Yes. So well. uh, yes. <laughs> yes, it's a good day to, I don't know. Stay inside and do stuff. <laughs> it's not the best weather here. So, um, yeah, don't want to say things that will get me demonetized. People are getting demonetized for the stupidest things today. So I'm not keeping my mouth shut on many topics. Ah, yeah, so channel ports. Um, kind of wondering, uh, as I always ask, and as you know, kind of, well, your interest in this, I'm sure you've been there many times, but uh, kind of if you've got any sort of insight onto us, why you kind of picked this area and, and kind of what you uh, well, will be doing with it in the future, I guess. We'll leave that a bit cryptic for now. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, it's often, as you, just, as you mentioned, the only, the, only, the only one of the channel port that usually gets any attention in Canadian circles is Dieppe. Yep. Uh, from, and not for the 1944 part of Dieppe, it's the 1942 Dieppe, obviously, the raid. Uh, and so for many Canadians, that's their only experience if they ever get a chance to visit uh, Europe and see these things. And so, you know, the typical itinerary is, you know, First World War, Vimy, Ypres, and then stop in Dieppe and head to Normandy. And, and, and you never actually see those other battles that happened in, in the month of September 1944 because uh, right. things are moving very quickly, right? As, and uh, so at the end of uh, Belays and 20, 26th, 27th of August, uh, the, the transition to, uh, to the, the, the pursuit, the advance across France and the attention, and then of course, what happens in the middle of that month is Market Garden, which takes a lot of attention, both then and now, away from these battles. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, it, uh, not, see, it's, it's not unknown, it's not forgotten, but it's one of the lesser visited and lesser treated, uh, you know, uh, subjects. Uh, Mark Zulke wrote a, a good book, finally, that that, uh, yeah. that covers that swath of the campaign in particular, and that's probably. Uh, the best, uh, the best collection of, if you're looking to read something, Cinderella campaign, I think it's called. And, um, uh, and, and uh, that sort of complements the old long left flank, you know, you know, Williams' book from, which was back from the 80s. There really hasn't been a lot of uh, study of it. So, or, 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 and certainly not a lot of you know, battlefield tourism in those, in those areas. So uh, that's one of the reasons I... Uh, Wanted to do this. This was originally when, when the, the signals tour that we ran last year. This was yes. going to be a, this was going to be an add-on to that tour uh, uh, before the main tour in, in the in the, the Nijmegen and the area. We we're yeah. going to take about ten people and, and, and tour the, the Scheldt and the, and the Channel ports. And so it sort of got can't COVID sort of ruined all those plans, like for many other things. Yeah. And so um, we've done a lot of a lot of work and study on it. So I wanted to. Uh, present some of it and maybe give people an opportunity to come and see it if they want to as well. Yeah, and we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about that uh, as we move along. Uh, but yeah, so you've prepared uh, a slide show talking about the liberation. So uh, without further ado, take it off. Right. So um, what I want to talk about today is that period of mainly September. It goes from like the 4th of September to the 1st of October, yeah. 1944, uh, for the Canadian Army uh, as it leaves Lower Normandy, as it was, uh, you know, as it was later called, and, and goes into what's, what's Upper Normandy, uh, and you know, the Dieppe up into the Channel of Pas de Calais area. So this all, you know, takes in the contents of what what's called the Great Swan, which is that race across France from the, 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 the Seine River um, to the borders of Belgium and, and Germany. And so 
that's that's what's going on in the Second British Army and, and the, you know, Patton's Army and all that, that massive charge across across Europe, where things you know units are moving you know, 20, 30 miles a day uh, and advancing along uh, straight towards places like Brussels and Antwerp and, and Ghent and Amiens and all the battlefields of the First World War. So that all happens, you know, from the crossing of the Seine to uh, to uh, the fourth and fifth of September. Now, for the Canadians, it's a little bit different because they actually have quite a fight to cross the Seine. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's uh, most of most of the British and, and American units that cross the Seine don't really have much of a fight. It's really more about bridging the river. And yeah. By the time they, as long as they get a, bri a bridge across, they then tear off across country with armored divisions leading. The Canadians, in particular, the second division has to do quite a lot of fighting in the Forêt de la Longue area to try and cross the. Get across the Seine in its sector, so there's some pretty bitty, bitter battles in, in that area, Bourg-Tirold, and all those those areas. So they're not unscathed, they're not un, unbattered as they come out from the Seine. So their departure, if you like, is a little bit uh, slower uh, and also less well resourced. So and and, and 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 their task, as we'll see, is all little bit, uh, their tasks change and, and evolve very very quickly during this time period, as as Monty is giving direction to. Uh, to career are to do various things and also all during this time period as we build up to the 17th of September and Monty is making his case for for market garden and so his perception of what the other armies are, are supposed to be doing uh, within that plan it changes and, and so the tasks change and it's a it's a bit of a an irony that the tasks go up and the resources go down yeah. as the Canadian army is is sort of stripped of resources to support uh, the uh, the market garden efforts, uh, both before and after the battle, uh, leaving uh, leaving King Army a little bit under resourced to do all the things it's been told to do. So we'll uh, we'll look a little bit at that. So what is the Canadian First Canadian Army on the fourth of September when we start this? Well, it's it's got two uh, two corps, so the first British Corps under John Croker, two British divisions, the 49th and the 51st. I'm, I'm not sure if it's unironically or, un, or not a coincidental coincidentally that these are two of Monty's less favorite divisions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so maybe they're grouped together and given the redhead stepchild given to the Canadians. I don't know. So it's a, it's, it's, it's an interesting theory, but uh, it just so happens that way. And uh, and then second Canadian Corps of Guy Simmons, which has the you know, the second, the third infantry, the fourth armored, and the first Polish, as well as the the army troops, the armor brigades, and the and the agras. There's actually an extra agra, the fourth agra, army group royal artillery that supports uh, in for a while at the beginning of this battle. So that's what it looks like at, at the beginning. So uh, you know, five, six divisions, uh, fairly uh, balanced force, and uh, certainly a, a, an experienced force as well. Yep. So. This is a little path, and this is, this is what Kriar gets told to do on the 26th of August, as they emerge from the Seine battle. So this is the 21st Army Group orders, what Monty is telling his two Army army commanders, Dempsey and Kriar, to do. And destroy the enemy in the Pas de Calais, and Flanders, and capture Antwerp. So moving down a level, the 1st Canadian Army is supposed to capture Le Havre, security up, and destroy all enemy forces up to Bruges. Whereas the Antwerp task has been given to the Second British Army, so within on the army, then the First British Corps is supposed to capture Le Havre, and the Second Canadian Corps capture Dieppe. Continue to push northeast across the across the River Somme. So they really don't go any at this point. The orders to the corps are just to get to the Somme, and then we'll see what happens at that point. We'll get more more orders. Uh, so that's that's the initial uh, tasks that are given by Kriar to his two uh, corps commanders. So for the for the first Canadian Army, there are a lot of challenges in this battle, and uh, one of them is the long lines of communication. We're still drawing supply, basically from the beaches, but but supply dumps that are around the town of Bayeux uh, is where we are getting our supplies from. Uh, so it's a long drive, uh, the American sort of uh, Red Ball Express experience, and, and, and on their side, but. Uh, we we're doing we we're doing things like grounding the Eighth Corps, all the, all the units of the Eighth Corps. You know, the core units, the artillery, the engineers, the support, all that are all basically their trucks are all taken away from them, and they're used to supply, uh, su supply or provide trucks for supplies. 
So uh, there, there are units that are idle in, uh, in Normandy waiting for the trucks to come back while they're being used to, to uh, maintain the lines of communication. But at the same time, if you look at a map, this is a, so that's 185 kilometers from Mahaf to Boulogne. And, uh, and, and you had to bring all these resources to bear and you've got, you've got your engineers, your artillery, your infantry, and uh, the, the, the battlefields, if you like, are three separate battlefields, La Havre, Boulogne, and Calais, are quite a bit uh, distance apart. So it's not as if you can attack one on one day and then switch, switch over to the other. Like in Normandy, the core front was maybe 10 kilometers. You yeah. have Corps, and yeah. now it's 185 kilometers. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, the, the challenges of communication and, uh, and the like. Uh, as to say, the resources start being taken away from the Canadians as this goes on. Goes on. Initially, uh, the fourth uh, fourth armored division is uh, is told to uh, is, is holding along the Breskin's pocket, and then the the first corps after it finishes in La Havre is is shifted over to the British side uh, to sort of shore up the front along the uh, the, 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 the market garden penetration, yep. and uh, the second division even is taken away just to told to occupy Antwerp after the British British hand over Antwerp to us. Uh, and the second division and gets that job. So, so really, all that uh, that Carrar and Simmons have left is the is the fourth armored and the third infantry division. That's that's it. So they've gone from six divisions to two in a period of about two weeks. Uh, the other aspect, of course, is uh, is um, casualties and and the state of things. And I'll put that this, this map here. This map shows you where everybody is on the fourth of September. You can see how far flung all the elements of the army are from down. I'm sure if you can see my mouse, but down on the far left, you have the two divisions of the first corps getting ready to attack Le Havre. Second division has just that day, you know, walked into Dieppe and liberated Dieppe. Uh, fourth division is crossing the Somme. The first Polish are a little bit beyond, and the third division is heading up towards towards Boulogne. And the British are way up, you know, at Antwerp, Bruges. Or Brussels and Bruges, uh, well far ahead across the army boundary. So that's that's how we're, we're spread out. And the idea was, at this point, the, the the second division, which had taken casualties in Normandy and then more casualties crossing the Seine, received a thousand uh, replacements uh, while they were in Dieppe. So Hurar and Simmons' intent was to leave them there and let them absorb these replacements. Uh, do a little bit of training, get get everyone integrated again, because that's you're talking about uh, you know uh, 120 guys per battalion, so almost a full company in every battalion, and, and in some cases more than that, uh, being integrated into the unit, and so they all have to you know learn some things again and learn how to work together. So that was the, that was the plan was to leave the second division out for uh, for a while to allow them to train up. Turns out they didn't they didn't really get a chance to do that, but uh, that was the plan. So you see that, that's, the, that's the lay down on the 4th of, of September. So then from the 4th onwards, uh, as they move up towards uh, the Breskins, you can see the, um, the second division gets told on the 7th. So they had three days to do this instead of a week and a half or two weeks they were planning to do it. You got three days to absorb all these replacements and then get on the road again and head up towards towards uh, Calais. And, uh, and so they're, they're, they set out. Uh, the Fourth Armored Division is moving up towards uh, towards Bruges, towards the, towards the Leopold Canal, into the Breskin Pocket, and the Poles are heading out, and they eventually liberate uh, Ghent. The Poles also uh, a bit of trivia if you're ever in Ypres. The Poles move through Ypres, and there's a plaque on the plaque on the cloth hall there that says the Polish division uh, moved through and, and liberated Ypres. And then the, the day after they liberated them, they started the ceremony up again uh, at yeah. the Menin Gate, which they do every day. So that's uh, that's their uh, claim to fame, and so, so this this is so once once again we're spread out from now Boulogne all the way to the uh, Leopold Canal, um, and uh, that's basically what, what happens on the fourth to the twelfth of September as these as we move forward. So uh, a very mobile battle, lots of uh, lots of changes, and I think the next one, yeah. So Monty Monty sends a signal to Creer on the sixth of September, and then. It's sort of in the context, I look at this signal sort of in the context of the little bit of a, of a squabble they had about Dieppe, remember, 
the Vermonti uh, was a little bit upset that Prerar skipped his uh, his meeting to go to the ceremony in Dieppe, and uh, uh, Monty was you know, at some point saying that you have to go until he realized you can't really fire a Canadian uh, and, uh, without the Canadian government's approval, yep. and it would be unlikely to get that. So they, they made made nice, and Monty sent a nice uh, apologetic letter. And so this is about two days later, two or three days later, he's sending a signal saying, I'd be very grateful for your opinion. You know? He's being very, uh, very uh, nice to, to career art about yes. the, the ca capture Boulogne, which really hadn't been on the map at that point. It was all about uh, Antwerp and Dieppe. But uh, it looks, and now they're realizing that Dieppe is, that Antwerp is not going to be usable because, it, because of the Scheldt, right? So can you... Can you get, what do you think about getting to Boulogne soon? So there's another task being added to the Canadian Army of liberating uh, Boulogne. But at some point, one concept was just to, just to, like they had done in Brest, just leave the Germans in those towns, and mask them off, and let, let, them, let them starve them out or let them sit there uh, and not bother attacking them. But if you need those ports, then you have to go into the town. And that's uh, that's the, the challenge here. So this... Uh, this shows a little map shows where people are on the 12th of September, uh, and this all on the left shows you all the, the evolution of all the tasks that the Canadians are getting within a period of, of, of uh, 10 days. So on the 4th of September, the first map we were looking at, they're supposed to capture Le Havre, uh, capture Dieppe, which they've done, and then destroy the, all the enemy up to Bruges. Two days later, let's now capture Le Havre, destroy all the enemy up to Bruges, and capture Boulogne. Uh, three days later after that, you've got Boulogne, Dunkirk, and Calais were added to that list. Uh, but and the, and the idea of getting to of uh, destroying the enemy, ever, all the enemy in between is sort of getting less emphasis. It's more important to go those get those ports. By the 13th of September, you know, we've, we've captured La Havre. Uh, we now want to capture uh, Boulogne, Dunkirk, and Calais. And now we need to open up the approaches to Antwerp. So this is a whole new and very big job being added on the 13th of September to the First Canadian Army tasks. So the very next day, new, more, more changes to the task. You know, complete the capture of Boulogne Calais because they're sort of they're about to start at that point. The 15th of September is when they start attacking Boulogne. Just mask, just sort of screen off Dunkirk. Don't bother taking Dunkirk. Dunkirk's a very small port. Yeah. Uh, compared to Boulogne and Calais, so they're saying we'll just uh, we'll just uh, mask it or uh, isolate the Germans that are in there, and now enable the full use of Antwerp. And so that's they're all supposed to be doing all of these things at the same time from the period of 14th of September. Uh, so at, and at this at the same time, on 14th to 15th of September, that's when they lose the British Corps, goes over, moves all the way over from uh, La Havre all the way over to uh, to uh, the area west, uh, east of uh, bergenau Zoom and uh, that area around Eindhoven, that area, sort of south and east of Eindhoven. Um, and then, uh, and of course, they still have to hold Antwerp itself, where the second division is now occupying the city of Antwerp, and uh, and then and then the front along uh, along the uh, Breskin's pocket. At the same time, of course, the Germans during this time are trying to evacuate the Fifteenth uh, Army. On Zangen's army, out through across the, the, the Flushing pocket, down down through Walkern and, and back to get in. And there's lots of debate, you know, you know, what ifs of history is what if we had yeah. sealed them off earlier, and uh, uh, but then instead of fighting two divisions, we ended up fighting six or seven divisions in there. So, you know, it's a, it's the what ifs of history, but uh, it, all at the same time, the Germans are leaving behind large forces in the ports, but. Trying to get their army out of of here uh, and into uh, into the central part of the Netherlands. So for Krirar and Simmons, uh, this is uh, a battle that they're being asked to do more and more with less and less. Now, nominally Croker is still part of the First Canadian Army, but he's but his corps has been given tasks that are in support of the Second British Army, so to guard their flank. Right. So here's uh, we'll start working through the battles here. So this is the uh, the liberation of the uh, Hav called Operation Estonia. So uh, 
Crocker had been told to do this uh, around the end of August. So he had about uh, 10 days to sort of think about this and also move his two divisions into position, sort of like a left hook once they cross the Seine. Um, and they, they arrived there about the 2nd of September. Uh, when they got there, you know, they realized that this is not going to be a simple, they're not going to give up. That's what they're, they always arrive sort of thinking, well, maybe the Germans will surrender. Yep. I'll, I'll just walk in. But in, in all of these cases, that doesn't happen. So uh, they realized we're going to have to do a full up attack here. And we have to gather the resources. So it's still Crocker, or Croker, Crocker. I was I've mixed between the two. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's Crocker, but yeah, I, so I could be wrong. Is uh, tells tells uh, Carrara that it'll take him about uh, uh, a week to get everything sorted out. He has to bring up the guns, and the things that become critical in these battles that that show up in all of them are the, the funnies, you know, the avries, the bridge layers, uh, the, the crocodile flame throwing tanks, uh, and the armored personnel carriers, the kangaroos and the army level artillery. So there's only so much of that to go around that we, we, we don't have enough to have both corps being able to do battles with these things at the same time. So they're all allocated to uh, Crocker and they have to get there, drive there. And, and a lot of these things, uh, they don't drive on the road, they drive on flatbed trucks and they have to be carried there by the service corps and all that. So it's a major event to do yeah. this. Uh, and so um, they they move up, and, and when you look at this map, map of Le Havre, you can sort of see Le Havre, uh, the city Le Havre in the middle, but it's sort of there's there's uh, sort of water on three sides, and we've got the uh, coastal guns along here. But the weak and the weakest, the landward defenses of Le Havre were not as strong as as uh, they were expecting them to be. I mean, they they were most of the of the Concrete was poured along the coast, and the, the weakest part of the of the German defenses, once they sort of probed them, is this northern area here, where the two divisions eventually end up uh, attacking at a place called Octeville sur Mer. So they uh, uh, they hadn't finished the landward defenses by the time we show up. So the, the other thing that's here, of course, is coastal 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 guns. You've got uh, 14, one 14.8 or 380 millimeter gun, 270 millimeter guns. Fortunately, most of those can't shoot landward. They're going to shoot out right. to sea. Yep. But uh, there's also there's about 44 uh, medium and field guns and 32 anti-aircraft guns. Uh, a bit of a challenge for the Germans is many of these are French or Czech guns. So ammunition supply is variable depending on uh, what they have. So as they're moving into position, and it shows you the, the you know, we look at these coastal guns and say, you know, did they ever fire a shot in anger? Well, certainly on the 5th of September, the monitor Erebus and eventually the battleship Warspite show up and start to try and neutralize these guns. And they quickly, both are hit. The Erebus is hit twice and actually has to withdraw. So these coastal guns still can, uh, still have a pack punch. You know, they're, uh, they're not to be ignored if you were gonna uh, out to sea. So they, they, they stop that and they bring in uh, bring in the bombs. And one thing that'll be sort of a theme throughout these battles is the close support of Bomber Command to all of these fights. Um, uh, we, we started doing that in Normandy with uh, Tractable to Totalize, uh, and certainly uh, any chance that the Canadian Army can to, to get those resources, uh, they, they get them. And, and it's an interesting comparison that, you know, on the day that Market Garden is launched on the 17th September, there's about 500 bombers supporting the attack into Boulogne. So it, it's, it, it is a major effort for the RAF and the RCAF. It's also there as well. Um, and uh, Bomber Command actually is uh, quite cooperative with the Canadian Army. Uh, yeah. they're, uh, they're, they're, whether they're eager to, to help or they're eager to prove their worth or, or whatever, or uh, Bomber Harris had a good day. But uh, certainly the, the, the RAF Bomber Command staffs are all very uh, enthusiastic or very willing to cooperate with the Army. It's, it's at the in-between levels, the Allied Expeditionary Force, Second Tactical Air Force, 84th Group, that, that uh, start to uh, 
well, they throw throw wrenches in the works, but they're, they they want to follow the proper procedure, and they're they're very concerned as the RAF always is in, about identifying themselves as an independent service. We're not, we don't work for the army, so you got to you have to ask us. You can't task us, sort of thing. Yeah. So that that comes to for, uh, to the for more in Boulogne than it does here in, in uh, Le Havre, but. Uh, so the, the bombing starts, and there are still 30,000 French civilians in Le Havre out of the population of about 160,000. So there's still quite a large civilian population and uh, a garrison of about 8,000. Now, uh, a very wide variety of troops, from naval fortress troops to actual infantry to, uh, to uh, what they call Festungsturmabteilung, so, so fortress battalions. They don't have a lot of vehicles. Uh, they don't have a lot of mobility. But they got lots of machine guns and lots of bullets, and so uh, in, in fixed fortifications, they can be quite uh, problematic for the uh, for the attackers. So uh, they drop about four thousand tons of explosives on the hub before we before the battle starts, and on the fit on the tenth, uh, the uh, the two divisions, the fifty first Highland and the forty ninth, are attacking side by side there. With, 51st on the right and 49th on the left, uh, each with a tank brigade in support. And, and they push uh, in and capture those heights of Octaville. Uh, they've, they've got a lot of artillery as well. The Erebus comes back uh, to, to shell, but is hit again. But uh, they do shell. They hit the, the Grand Clo battery. In about 30, 30 of the 130 rounds actually hit the battery. Which is pretty pretty good shooting, and they have they have spotter aircraft to help them. So the the the, uh, the war spite fired about 304 rounds. They finally supported the uh, or, or silenced the Grand Clo battery, which you can see over here on the left. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. Um, at the end of, before the attack. So at 4:15 p.m., so the attack sort of starts at the end of the day, and a lot of that's time to the Air Force availability when, when they can fly and weather. All that. So 4:15 p.m. The main bomber command attacks. 932 aircraft uh, drop bombs uh, on, uh, on 4,719 tons of bombs. Um, and afterwards, when the operational research guys go in, they say, you know, open emplacements and open trenches. You know, lots and lots of damage. Very little damage to the heavy concrete stuff from from these bombs. But uh, imagine if you're inside, you know, there'd be a lot of noise, a lot of shaking. They didn't destroy a lot of things with those bombs. So at uh, about 5.45 p.m., the, the, the 49th Division starts its attack. So the, the flail tanks, uh, and it's by this time, you know, the British Commonwealth attack uh, through an obstacle belt is fairly well practiced. The flails, the crocodiles, the avaries, uh, with the scenes and petards and bridge layers uh, start to uh, breach the, the obstacles. Uh, and the kangaroos. Now, uh, the kangaroos at this time, I think, yeah, the kangaroos are still the old converted artillery pieces, the M7 defrock priest kangaroos. Yeah. This is their last uh, last few battles here. Uh, in October, they're replaced with the with the ram kangaroos, but at this point, they're still using those 72 uh, converted M7 priests that the third division gave up. And that's what they've, they've got for uh, our personnel carriers, as well as half tracks that they, they use as well. So now they're carrying the infantry forward. Uh, and they, uh, so they, they, they do the initial attack. They seize the heights. And then the 51st Highland Division does a night attack at midnight. They join in the attack. So it's a sort of sequence staged attack. So you can get maximum support from your artillery. And... They go into this, the area of this forest here in the middle, the Forêt de Montgéon. So this is all happening on the night of the 10th, beginning of the 11th. So Bomber Band comes back on the 11th. 146 aircraft dropped 742 tons of bombs on the western part of the town. And uh, uh, Crocker actually ends up sending a signal back to Harris saying, thank you for the absolute accuracy of the bombing that you did today you know it was right on target and uh, and, uh, and time on target and on time so this day the 49th moves south on the southern parts of the plateau here uh, 
the the main problem for the advance is is mines. So there's advance through there are either mines on the vehicles and they, they have to dismount and they move through the minefields and then for any personnel mines, flails come up and help. But uh, that's in, that's the main cause of casualties amongst the, uh, the British troops who are, who are invading. So the last part of the battle, uh, the, company, the, the 49th sort of shifts over to the uh, east of the town and comes along the river into the uh, into the town here, uh, and. And, and the 51st moves into the northern outskirts of the town and captures those batteries along the coast. And that's when, uh, at the end of the 12th, the uh, Colonel Wildermuth, who's the commander, is uh, you know, wounded in a bunker and uh, actually surrenders to a bunch of tanks. So a bunch of un tanks uh, with no infantry, right. seven all tank regiment, just show up at his bunker and start shelling it. And that's when that's when uh, things uh, he, he surrenders uh, and. At the end of it, he sort of he complimented the British troops on their correct and gentlemanly behavior. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right. so he walked into captivity. So it took it took two days, 48 hours, to, to reduce La Havre. Uh, they captured uh, 11,302 prisoners uh, of, of the garrison. And uh, casualties in the first British Corps for the period of the assault, this is uh, the two days of the assault, yeah. 388. So very, very light casualties, mostly from mines. And uh, basically the, the heavy bombardment, not that it hadn't destroyed much, but it had convinced many of the Germans in those bunkers that once they, once a British soldier showed up, they would they would throw in the towel, throw in the white right. flag. So it didn't, didn't destroy a lot of things, <clears throat> but it did, did work a number on their, on their morale. Now, the challenge, of course, the we're here to capture a port, but the Germans, of course, have destroyed the port rather systematically, blowing up the moles, blocking blocking the slipways, sinking ships in the harbor. And so uh, they would not actually re reopen the port of La Havre until the 9th of October, so a month later, to clear this. So after the First Corps moves out, the engineers move in, and they start to rehabilitate the port as fast as they can. So that evening, after this, this so this battle is relatively successful and relatively quick. Two days is not not that bad, and low casualties. So that sort of um, raises expectations that other things will happen as quickly. And so Monty then sends that signal to uh, Carrera, saying, "Not so worried about uh, not so worried about uh, Calais and Dunkirk, but we need Boulogne like right away. How fast can you do it?" And uh, and then can you speed up this Antwerp business, as he calls it? <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so the next phase then becomes the capture of, of Boulogne. And so what happens, of course, is all of those resources besides the two infantry divisions, the funnies, the flails, the APCs, the, the artillery, mm -hmm. all have to move now from Le Havre to the area of Boulogne. Because uh, the third division has been a, moving up to Boulogne, with the once again the optimistic expectation that maybe they'll surrender once they hear once that uh, once once Le Havre falls. Of course, the problem with that is they, there's no communication between these two organizations. They don't even know that the other battles are happening. So when, right. when you when you when you capture the Germans, you tell them, by the way, we've also captured Le Havre, we've also captured Dieppe, and they have no idea what you're talking about. So the idea that you know the morale would, would spread is not uh, not really based in. in the, the reality of communications amongst the Germans. Yep. So, <clears throat> yes, we'll uh, go to the next operation, Wellhead. And so, we'll, uh, Brad, you switch over to the Project 44 map. And if you haven't seen it, the Project 44 map uh, of Wellhead is extremely well done uh, using uh, Google Earth and, and overprints and uh, 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 of, the, of the battlefield and uh, so shows a timeline. So, <clears throat> Dan Spry, who's the commander of uh, Third Division, he takes over after uh, Keller. Well, after Keller's wounded and Blackadder takes over temporary command after Normandy, basically. Yep. Spry is brought over from Italy and uh, uh, is given command of the Third Division. Now, he's uh, 31 years old, major general. Uh, so uh, young young guy, and he's uh, 
commanding three three brigadiers are, are quite well experienced as you can be in the third division. They've been fighting since D-Day, yep. basically. Yep. So you know, Blackadder, who's in the fifth brigade, and yes, his name is Blackadder. <laughs> yep. But, uh, Ken, Ken Blackadder from Montreal. Uh, Jock Sprague in the eighth brigade, who had commanded the Queen's Own Rifles on D-Day. And, and then uh, John Rockingham of, uh, of, had been in the Royal Hampton Light Infantry and now commands the ninth brigade. So three very, very competent, some of the best uh, brigade commanders, if you like. Um, sorry, six, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, seventh, eighth, and ninth. Uh, not the fifth brigade. Fifth brigade is, uh, is uh, McGill. Anyway, so um, so they are, uh, are, are experienced brigade commanders, and this guy comes from India, and, and Sprague commanded a brigade briefly in, in Italy. He commanded the 12th brigade, which was sort of that First Stats Brigade made up of uh, gunners and infantry and whatever in, in the 5th Division. And it commanded the RCR in in Italy. So he, and he was a pre-war regular soldier, so which always does you good, good in good stead with, with career R if you're a pre if you were a pre-war regular yep. to get, uh, get uh, opportunities. Yep. So there's a there's a bit some writing about that whether the three brig brigadiers I mean, this is really his first battle right, yep. as a commander. So so he uh, He's told by Kerar and, and Simmons to, to, do, to do it right uh, and to uh, to not rush it. Um, they do send up the Seventh Brigade. Uh, does does arrive and uh, probe the defenses. The the Recce Regiment, the Seventh Reconnaissance Regiment, shows up as well, and they sort of probe, realize that, that, that Boulogne is is very well defended. As we're entering now into the area of the Pas de Calais. Which is where the Germans thought we were going to land, right? In in, uh, in D Day, mm -hmm. so a lot of defenses from from Boulogne to Calais and along to uh, to Dunkirk and and Ostend. This is where the Germans have have poured on, probably on a two to one basis, concrete compared to what they poured in Normandy. So there's there's lots and lots of defensive positions. The challenge is the the, the quality uh, quality of the troops and the quantity of the troops, mm -hmm. but. Uh, you know, as, as it's been said, you know, it doesn't take much morale to sit in a bunker and fire a machine gun if you're not being asked to maneuver to, in face of the enemy or just being asked to defend. The, uh, you know, those kind of troops can do, can cause a lot of casualty. Yep. So it takes uh, four days to move all the guns and the engineers and the APCs from La Havre to Boulogne. Uh, so that's uh, the 12th or up around the around the uh, 15th. So they basically arrive just in time to attack. Uh, so the, the, the attack starts on the uh, sorry the 17th. Yep. 15th is when they arrive. They have two days to sort things out. So the garrison here is about uh, about 10,000 again. We think it's about five to seven thousand, but it's t about 10,000 troops under uh, Lieutenant General Ferdinand Heim. Who had been uh, Guderian's chief of staff from Poland, and you know, so he's not a not a slouch, nope. but um, he's uh, been sent here to hold Festung Boulogne. It's now been declared a fortress, which means he's uh, honor bound to defend it to the death and all that kind of stuff. So he's got ten thousand troops, got, of which two thousand are actually infantry, yeah. and the rest are uh, are you know, Luftwaffe anti aircraft guns, fortress gunners, supply people. All that sort of thing. So, uh, but a good part of the 64th Infantry Division basically is here, which we'll see again. The, the rest of it is up in the Scheldt, where we'll see it uh, in the Breskin's pocket. So, once again, the guns you've got 12 uh, inch uh, guns in, in casemates. Once again, they can't fire Landry, which is good. 22 88 millimeter guns and nine 150 millimeter howitzers in the 64th Division. Uh, there weren't, weren't very many anti-tank guns, and there were still about 8,000 civilians left in the city. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, what's going on behind the scenes is the um, our civil affairs people are sort of making arrangements of what are we going to do with these people once we capture this city. So Spry comes up with a, a four-phase plan. So he's going to uh, uh, launch his main attack in the east. Uh, near Molambert, if, if, uh, if you contour map Molambert, which is sort of the central part in here, it's a very high hill 
to the east of the city and dominates the entire area. You can see the entire battlefield from the top of Mont Lambert. Um, and that's sort of the, uh, the key to the defense. So he's going to attack that and then the valley beside it here with the 8th and the 9th brigades. And then, the, and then they'll basically drive into the city, the Lian River, which throw, flows through uh, Boulogne. They're going to try and capture bridges across the Lian River and then move through the city. They also have to go up here on the north of the city. There are uh, coastal batteries here as well, some rather large ones. Mm -hmm. One of them is, is manned by 450 soldiers in one coastal battery. Um, and so that's another secondary task for them. But the main, main, drag, main drive will be through the city and down and around. At the same time, the, the Cameron Highlanders of Ottawa, which is an interesting and sort of not often talked about role for them because they're the machine gun battalion of the, of the yep. division. So they have the Vickers machine guns and the 4.2 inch mortars. Well, they're given what they call an economy of force mission. In other words, they're holding the southern edge of the city and uh, keeping the Germans pinned down because they have a lot of firepower, not, not a lot of people, lots of firepower in those Vickers and mortars so they can dominate the area around here and sort of hem the Germans in. So the reconnaissance guys and the Camerons actually have a, you know, the Camerons have sort of a, you know, like a forward deployed infantry role, if you like, yeah. during this phase of the battle, which is, uh, they hadn't quite, hadn't really done that in Normandy much. So, once again, uh, the aerial bombardment was the last part of the program to be, be is sorted out. And it um, this is where it sort of ran into a bit of the bureaucracy of the Air Force, because uh, the way things are supposed to work is, is 84th Group, which is the RAF group that supports the Canadian Army, is headquartered with the 1st Canadian Army headquarters, usually all the time. Uh, and so all requests go up there, and then they're sent up to the Allied Expeditionary Air Force headquarters, which is in Versailles, and, and then over to Bomber Command. So it's a very Air Force, Air Force gets a chance to review all these requests. Now the, um, the uh, problem was they, they didn't have a lot of time. So on the 15th, two days before the battle starts, Simmons and his chief of staff, uh, General Creer's chief of staff was a church man, and the senior Air Force the officer, uh, Air Colonel Brown, uh, go to Versailles directly to talk about bomber yeah. support. Right. So they uh, they basically they as they explained they, they buttoned up support. In other words, they coordinated face to face on the ground with the Allied Expeditionary Air Force people for uh, air support for both Boulogne and Calais. So he laid out his plan. Uh, they were getting a lot of pushback from the, the staff there when uh, it just happens that uh, Tedder, Harris, and Lee Mallory all showed up at the same time at, at the headquarters while Simmons and his people were there. So they, they seized the, So Simmons seized the opportunity to sort of, you know, grab him in the, in the coat room and say, listen, we need to sort this out. And, and, and apparently uh, Harris was all over it, you know, no, no problem. Whatever he wants to do, we'll do. So he basically you know, short-circuited the whole staff work process by talking to Harris directly with Tedder and Lee Mallory there to say this is what we need to do for uh, for Boulogne. So it all it all worked. They said if, if Boulogne is Boulogne is, is is their number one task right now, then, then we need to do everything we can to get it, and everything we can included uh, a lot of bombers from Bomber Command. So. Uh, Spry then sends the word that is D-Day or is, uh, is going to be on the 17th of September. And so it's happening, as I said, at the same time as, as Market Garden. So as this is going on, of course, the Air Force is attacking all of these places around here, doing attacking lines of communication, uh, targets of opportunity. So 49 attacks were made by typhoons and medium bombers of the Second Tactical Air Force in the area of Boulogne. Um, battery positions, uh, artillery that's growing around, ammunition, uh, and then the, the heavy bombers come in. We have 328 uh, guns were mustered to support this. So you have the, uh, the third division's guns, the 51st Highland Division guns are brought in, uh, five field regiments, seven medium regiments, three heavy and two heavy anti aircraft. So that's my, my gunner plug for the day. Yep. Uh, <laughs> support this. 
Uh, and they're also supporting the bombing because they're going to fire something called an apple pie, hmm. which is basically they fire airburst ammunition all over the area of suspected anti-aircraft guns, trying to keep the anti-aircraft guns uh, gunners heads down. And uh, this is all coordinated by Brigadier Stan Todd, who's the commander of the Royal Artillery. They also, uh, unusually, get some support from uh, across the channel. Yes. So the coastal guns in Dover, which had been shooting at German ships in the channel since, uh, since the war started, really, and trading the odd shot back and forth across with the, the German guns once they're built. Um, so the, the, commander of the, the commander of the Army Artillery, Brigadier Brownfield, goes and, uh, and, and arranges for them to support this attack. And so mainly by trying to suppress, because just north of here, which we'll come to later, are the big coastal batteries of Cap Green A, uh, Battery Tote, and uh, Grosser Kerfer's batteries that are 15 and 16, 14 and 15 inch guns that can shoot across the channel. And they're concerned about them hitting, A, if they can, if they can shoot south, because they're not 100% sure they can't shoot them down along the coast as we're attacking. Right. So they want them to be kept busy by the coastal guns in uh, in Dover. So they have a uh, air OP, an Oster aircraft is used, and they uh, they they fly uh, both on the 16th and the 17th, the 16-inch guns from uh, from uh, from across the way. The, well, there's two the, the two famous ones are two 14-inch guns, Winnie and Pooh, as they're called, yep. uh, the Royal Marines, and then there's two 15-inch guns of the Coast Regiment firing with air observation. So um, they, uh, they managed to keep the, the guns, the 16-inch guns, the German guns, uh, busy, uh, firing at a range of about 42 kilometers across the across the channel. So that's all uh, sort of a unique bit of the, uh, the artillery support to this operation. So on the, in the morning of the 17th of September, the first uh, bombers show up. Uh, 540 Lancasters, 212 Halifaxes, and 40 Mosquitoes. Uh, uh, which two two aircraft are lost during the, during the attack? Um, once again, the Germans say not a lot of people killed, but a lot of things suppressed, a lot of uh, open positions destroyed, and uh, basically the investigators found because they plotted the area that the bombs dropped in, and they sort of said anywhere the bombs dropped uh, were captured very quickly. Right. Anywhere where the bombs didn't drop is where the resistance tended to be stronger. So uh, despite not actually blowing up any of these casements, they were reducing the will to fight of the guys inside. So as we'll transition now into the, the battle, so on the 17th, I'm going to click on there. There we go. I don't know if you can zoom in a little bit there, uh, Brad. There we go. So this is the, the, the fight on the 17th. Another interesting part of this battle, sort of a little sideline, is that because it was a well-defined enemy and we controlled the area around here, they actually uh, set up uh, bleachers uh, yeah. on a hill near Boulogne where uh, staff officers or any other, any, anyone else could come and watch the bombing. They could they'll watch that bombing at Mont Lambert, which is, which is the, <laughs> this big high hill here, which was a main target of the bombing. And so uh, it was almost like they had to sign a waiver saying, if you go up there and you get killed, it's your own fault. But well, <laughs> if you want to go up there and look at the bombing, you can. Yeah. So and, and there's footage of it as well on the newsreel. Right. That's right. You find a newsreel yeah. or footage of, of the, of the of, from that vantage point. I always want yep. to find that where that stand was set up. But the, yeah. I mean, probably could do it with a little digging. So, so on the 17th, then, the, uh, the fight starts. And you've got the 9th Brigade. The North Novies and the SDGs and the 8th Brigade, the Queen Zone, and the Chaudiers, those are the four arrows from bottom to top there, who was set off uh, to attack. So the, uh, they attack at 9.55 in the morning. Uh, so the, 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 uh, they move through the North, and then the North Shore Regiment is supposed to sort of move off to the north and capture those batteries, uh, those, those elements on the other side. So the Eighth Brigade uh, goes through places called uh, places called Marlborough and Saint Martin Boulogne. They advanced against Marlborough. They they ran into a, uh, a radar station that was intact in the hamlet of Rupembert, and they were by nightfall they were consolidating at Marlborough. So that's them. Uh, that's them there. The top top arrow, if you like. 
Queen's Own uh, went to Saint Martin Boulogne. By 11 a.m., they captured the railway station, and, and they were close to the citadel of Boulogne. And you often hear in the reports of the time they talk about the citadel in Boulogne, which really wasn't a fort. It was sort of like uh, if you've ever been to Quebec City, it's like the old Quebec. It's like a walled part of the city. So it's the oldest part of Boulogne, and it's on a hill, and it's got a wall around it. So people would call it the Citadel, but the locals didn't call it the Citadel. It was just called the Old City, the Old Boulogne. But it did have a moat, and it had a it had walls. So it, you know, for all intents and purposes, it was a bit of a it's fort-like. Yep. So they, they got pretty close to that. And uh, then the 9th Brigade uh, attacks Mont Lambert. So Flails and Avery's move up. And uh, but the, the challenge was sometimes the uh, you know the minefields are too deep, so the in, in infantry had to uh, dismount. And they, uh, the, the SDGs being towards a place called La Capelle down in through here, galloping kangaroos under a tremendous barrage of artillery race up to the minefields. Uh, and the, 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 the artillery program was because you're using armor personnel carriers, you can keep up to the guns. That's the great advantage of the APCs, you don't hear. Uh, Troops are protected, so you can get closer to the artillery and therefore be on the Germans much more quickly. Um, minefield stopped the kangaroos, but they, but they went forward on foot, and they only took 45 minutes to capture their first objective. And then, uh, and then the 18th Field Company, Royal Canadian Engineers, cleared the path through the minefield for them. North Novies, North Nova Scotia Highlanders, they ran into very Molambert was probably the, the most defended part of the of the of the battle. Most there was there's. There's still concrete bunkers up there to this day, um, and it was a it was a radio station as you can tell. You know the, high, the highest ground was also they had the radar and radio relay stations up there all under concrete. So there's lots of concrete on the top of Mont Lambert. So they um, General Hyme himself said, "If we lose Mont Lambert, we're basically done. Uh, you know, uh, if if that uh, it might take a little while, but if we, if we lose that ground." Uh, it's just a matter of time before Boulogne uh, falls. So they move up, and with the help of Avery's, uh, they continue up this hill. The hill's actually too steep for the, the kangaroos to, to climb. Right. But, but, Crockett, but Churchill's being great hill climbing tanks actually can make it up the hills with them to help them. Uh, so the crocodiles were, were up there, and the Avery's. And uh, at the end of the day here, there's a story of uh, a bunker that the, the isolated and were attacking and so a crocodile tank came up and they basically it emptied its flame reservoir at this bunker just basically continuously flaming it for as long as it takes to empty the reservoir probably a couple of minutes and the germans still wouldn't wouldn't surrender there was actually they were actually inside the bunker in a little sort of chemical shelter because they were worried about gas and so they have a, there's a shelter in the bunker and uh it took five hours of negotiation for them to uh Convinced the Germans inside to surrender, so uh, you know there were some 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 troops that were prepared to, to hold on. The, the, the so the level of resistance and the level of fortification is sort of putting paid to this idea that we could have taken you know Boulogne in a day, kind of thing. Which there had been a I guess a staff paper that often gets quoted saying you know we could, we could have taken Boulogne in a day and moved on to Calais the next day, and it said you know well. Uh, Nice, nice thing to say from your staff desk back in the army headquarters, but actually doing yeah. the fighting and moving the stuff around, it's just uh, not, not not realistic. So the 18th, which is the next day there, Brad, if you can click on the 18th arrows. So you see the North Shore starts to turn north to clear those batteries along the coast. And then the North Novies and the SDGs are trying to race into town to capture bridges over the Leanne River. Uh, the Chaudieres uh, captured something called the, the something called the Colonne de la Grande Armée, which is this uh, almost like Trafalgar Square column, but it's got Napoleon on top instead of, uh, instead of Nelson. <laughs> Marks the uh, high water mark of the, uh, yeah, the French attempt to uh, invade England. So he's yeah. looking out over the channel there, uh, wistfully thinking about uh, invading England, but that's as far as they got. But it's a monument that was put up in the eighteen mid-1800s. But um, still there. So the Chaudiers, as you said, move up and, and head to a place called La Tresorie, which is the battery uh, up there. The Queen's own advance to the southern outskirts of the city and the North Novis reached the so-called citadel in the center of town. 
so they're, they're sort of deciding what they're going to do to capture this, to take the, get into this part of this, the citadel. When a civilian comes up and sort of offers a guy named Major Stoddard, who's one of the company commanders in the in the North Nova Scotia Highlanders, says, I got a, there's a secret way into town. I can take it through the sewers. So he takes, a, takes it through a secret tunnel, as he called it, a passage in the wall, and sneaks him into uh, some of his troops into this into the center of the, uh, the citadel. At the same time, uh, a bunch of Churchill Avery's showed up uh, and basically fired their petards at the uh, at the gates of the of the, of the wall. So it's like sort of like a siege here, a medieval siege. Yeah, they're firing at the siege. They, they uh, crash down the gates of the town. The, the, the North Novas move in that way. And uh, very quickly, the Germans inside surrender. And at the same time, Stoddard and his troops sort of emerge from the from the, the cellars into the middle of all this. And so the uh, they took about 200 prisoners uh, within, uh, inside the city, including uh, 16 officers. The Highland Light Infantry then move forward to get to the Leanne, but they find that all the bridges across the river have been blown by the Germans. So there's there's no, they were hoping to capture one quickly, but it does, doesn't really happen. So that's sort of it's that's sort of the end of the second phase on the on this the 18th. So on the 19th, if you go to the next, uh, click the next one. I think that's more yeah to the to the south. You've got the uh, you scroll to the south there. You've got the uh, Camerons move in yeah. and uh, and they cross across across the end. They get they get rubber boats and then they eventually do build a bridge across and go into the other side of, of the town. Um, and then the 8th Brigade was then moving along to the north. So we click on one more on the 20th. Yeah, so they're, they're the, the, uh, the North Nova is clear to the south. So they're clearing from the inside out, which means a lot of these gun positions and everything are oriented the wrong way. So it's a, a easier for our guys to do that. Um, and they and moving north, they capture this town, uh, the a bunker at uh, Winel, which is the one that has 450 soldiers in it. And they also uh, capture the town of Wimaru, which is garrisoned, uh, doesn't have any bunkers in it. But uh, we know that that's the town where John McRae is buried. Yeah. He's buried in the Commonwealth Cemetery in Wimaru. So a deliberate uh, decision is made not to bomb Wimaru. Uh, so they, they just use light weapons and uh, uh, Colonel and General Colonel Anderson who's the, who's the commander of the of the uh, uh, the North Shore didn't want to use heavy bombardment and uh, they also knew there's lots of civilians in Wimaru too who had, who had left the town and just moved north so they uh, uh, they capture on, on the on the 22nd so there's a warm warm welcome for the population and some Terry Cop in one of the books said there should be a statue to, to Anderson and the town of Wimaru because he saved the town from from destruction, yeah. uh, but but uh, you know, it, it, it was, uh, not, not much known about that. So, uh, go to the next uh, 20, 20 second there, I think. Yeah, right, twenty first. Twenty first. Yep. So you see the uh, now they're they're moving along and clearing up the uh, the, the positions along from you know, from rolling them up on the flank, the North Novies, and then the last uh, last bunker. You get the last one there as well there. Red things. There we go. And there's they they meet, they meet up the Highland Infantry meet up with the North Novies on the uh, on the coast. There's another bunker along there. So Boulogne is cleared on the 22nd. So it takes uh, it takes it takes it takes seven seven uh, seven no five days to clear the clear the whole town. Yep. So once again, we take about we take 9,500 prisoners in in uh, Boulogne. Uh, and we lose 634 killed, wounded, and missing. Of which the, uh, the Highland, the uh, Highland Light Infantry, and the North Nova Scotia Highlanders, so Ninth Brigade, they take the most casualties because they were the ones fighting on Molan Bear. And uh, but still, 600 out of the whole division is not uh, not, too, not too heavy casualties considering what they had to overcome here. So the and many Canadians commented that if you know if the if the German, if this if they hadn't had the bombardment and the Germans hadn't had to, you know hadn't been prepared to fight harder it would have been much much more difficult 
they uh, they said in some cases near the end of the battle they were running into Germans with all their kit packed up, ready to ready to march off into captivity. Uh, <laughs> they, they were done done fighting, and of course it was the, it was the German artillery, which there was a lot here, that caused most of our casualties. Right, so that's uh, that's Boulogne. Once again, the Germans have destroyed the harbor. Uh, they, uh, you know, in 1937, a million tons of cargo came into Boulogne, so it's, it's a significant port for 1944. It's a very, it's a very small place now, but if you compare it at the time, it was uh, you know, probably the number three port along the coast. Uh, but it's been completely destroyed, and it won't be till the 12th of October. So about a, once again a month to clear the uh, the positions. So that's that's the story of uh, of Boulogne. Yep. Presentation. Yeah, so I'll just link this map down uh, below right. for those who haven't seen it before. And then that links to all of Project 44's maps. They're fantastic, and there's a ton of them. Yeah, you can you all these layers that are here on the left. You can take them all off and look yeah, at them. Yeah, and then, yeah, I can take off all the days and just see the defenses. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can just, just do like the minefield. The are, where, the, where the guns are. It's, it's very. And, as, and the closer yeah. you zoom down to it, the more it's starting to use uh, air photos as well. You can see the gray uh, actual yeah. air photos of the day as, as opposed to the Google Earth and the contours. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an amazing, yeah. amazing resource uh, from Project 44 yeah. that has, has created. Uh, yeah. That, uh, yeah, a lot was put into that one for sure. And you did, you did, you did all the text, right, didn't you? Uh, uh, I did the story part. The story, uh, right. Go, well, hold on yeah, I did like uh, this part here. I'm talking about the right. overall campaign and right. And basically high level of what each pretty much battalion did and kind of talking about the defenses. yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. great. So that's just this is this is my backup in case the map didn't work. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll get to go. Uh, you know it worked, which is great. So now I move on to Calais. Which is the next fight? You can see it starts on the 25th of September, so three days later. Uh, still, the third division. So the third division is doing this uh, as, again. They, they have sent the seventh brigade has gone up to uh, to sort of probe out the defenses, mask it off, along with the, the reconnaissance regiment again, uh, seventh recce, uh, just to see if by any chance they might they might be surrendering, but they're not. Nope. Um, and so the division moves up again, moves the guns. It's not as far as it is to uh, from Le Havre to Boulogne, but it's still about 80, 80 to 100 kilometers. And the complicating factor here, if you look at the bottom right-hand map, the Calais area, you've got Calais, but you've also down at the bottom left, you've got all those gun positions, those uh, coastal forts. So they want to take Calais is, is, is the primary one, but they want to mask and isolate the the, the Coastal guns, so they don't interfere. So they they send uh, the reconnaissance regiment is there for most of the time, just screening them. And they also create a 3.2 kilometer long smoke screen yep. that, that lasts for uh, I think a week. So uh, yep. they, they basically smoke generators from chemical water companies or chemical companies, just constantly generating smoke to screen off, so that uh, they're not too worried about the guns. The guns can't actually fire. But they're worried about the Germans looking into the rear of the Canadians as they're attacking and calling down artillery from within Calais or from other places, like providing observation. Because they, the Germans, uh, this is, the cliffs are actually quite high as you come to them, and then you go down into the low ground behind them. And so to, to mask those batteries, to mask the observation, they, they create this massive smoke screen uh, along there. So... So there's seven heavy batteries around Calais. Uh, this is the major coastal artillery uh, area. Uh, and it's obviously came, came very clear that we'd have to do another deliberate assault on Calais to, uh, to, to capture it. But in Calais, and I think, I don't know where I am, I'm zoomed in there. Oh, it's, where is that? Nope, back. Right, I thought I'd put another map in there. Anyway, um, the upper part of the map is the one where we, we're looking at. Now, Calais is very different from Boulogne. There's not a lot of hills. It's very flat, very marshy. Uh, and so you have flooded, German, and the Germans have flooded areas around Calais uh, 
similar to what they did in the Netherlands, where they opened up the sluice gates and flooded the fields so uh, we couldn't land paratroopers. Because once again, they're expecting, this is where they're expecting us to land uh, in D-Day. Uh, so, uh, well, and then they have these boxes or defended areas around these towns that they, uh, they occupy. And that's sort of the plan is to basically attack on the left, drive down the coast into the town as opposed to coming, this basically is an, almost a no-go area in terms of swamp and water and there's basically a narrow causeway along a road and a railroad. So mm -hmm. Spry's plan is to assault to the left and then move down the coast. So they're thinking that they could start on the 19th of September, but once again, the, the strength of the, of, the, of the defenses and the size of the forces they now need it's, it's postponed again, and then uh, they got to move all the funnies and the engineers and all that sort of thing. They also are make, trying to make a decision, or there's some talk about just why don't we just mask Calais, let's just leave Calais uh, uh, and, and move on because of the urgent need to move to, uh, to, to clear the Scheldt. But the decision is finally taken that we need to, we need to take Calais, we need those ports. Uh, and so we'll uh, we'll attack it. So uh, on the set on, before they before the battle starts on the 16th and 17th, while the battle of Boulogne is going on, uh, the Seventh Brigade makes a makes an attempt just to see if they can yeah. roll it up quickly. They, they attack uh, some of the batteries along the on the on the Cape. Uh, basically, they find out very quickly that they need more support. That, that, uh, uh, they can't just do it with one battalion or two battalions. Yeah. The uh, basically what you have in Calais is a series of of islands or in defenses based on sort of boxes or or all around defense. They still have a lot of the old forts, which are some of them are still there. Fort de Nuley is still there. It looks exactly the same as it did in the day. It's got a lot of uh, seventy five millimeter shell holes in the walls and uh, machine gun bullets on it. But because uh, Calais has as we know from you know, general history, Calais has been besieged many times by the English and the French in the, in, in the wars, the Hundred Years' War. Uh, and so it has a lot of those old fortification areas are still there. Uh, and they had basically been completely focused on uh, a, a seaward attack, like a beach landing in their defenses. So the commander, back, we're back down to Lieutenant Colonel's commanding Schroeder, Basically, almost no attempt had been made to defend on the landward side. They were relying on natural defenses, some minefields, but there weren't large defensive works. All the concrete was along the coast. Uh, but they have, uh, you know, a lot of guns around here, and some of these guns that are further back can actually shoot into the area. So you've got the, the Noir Mutt, which is on the coast, which is, has three, three 16-inch guns. Uh, and then... Uh, You've got the, then you got the, the big guns down at Cap Green A as well. So we thought that there was about uh, 5,000 troops in Calais. Turns out there were about uh, 7,500. And once again, uh, a mixed bag. Uh, Schroeder himself, after his capture, uh, perhaps trying to blame his troops, says they were mere rubbish. <laughs> Not exactly confidence building. Uh, about 2,500 of them, so about half of them were infantry, though. So they weren't all right. coastal defense yeah. or rear echelon guys. There were there were 2,500 infantry. Uh, but two-thirds of the remainder were, were basically manning the guns and the port. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, once again, they didn't really, they, they, these, are the, these are the guys who, they actually do find out, they learn that Calais and the Hav and Boulogne have been captured now. So they, they are they are getting news of that. So once again, we, we call on the heavy bombers and uh, to uh, support this. And uh, finally, after all the uh, bits and pieces are moved up from uh, from Boulogne, they decide on the 20, uh, 24th, 25th, night of the 24th uh, of, uh, of September. So then on the, the day, you've got uh, 633 aircraft attacked uh, on a scow, 3,000 tons of bombs dropped. Uh, there was bad weather on the 24th when uh, 
188 aircraft came and attacked Calais again. Uh, and uh, they had thought that the raid was canceled. The, the army had been told this raid was going to be canceled, but it, 180 of them went ahead anyway. And uh, there's you know, dire reports of you know, no no suppression of the anti-aircraft was undertaken because they thought the raid was canceled. So uh, the, uh, the anti-aircraft, the German aircraft was quite active, and, and uh, the, some of the gunners, some of the gunners, a report, you know, we were we were upset that, with the, that the about seven or eight aircraft were shot down. Uh, when they thought they could have suppressed the anti-aircraft, but uh, that that's uh, just lack of coordination. Mm -hmm. So then uh, the main bomber attack on D-Day itself, now 900 more bombers come in, but only 303 of them actually attack because of clouds and bad weather over the targets. Um, once again, same sort of issues with not a lot of destruction, but a lot of morale reduction and uh, and reducing the will to fight of the uh, troops that are left. So on, on the 25th then, after this aerial bombardment, the 8th Brigade comes along and attacks Camp uh, Blanay. And uh, the battery of, of Noir Mutt on, on this side of the battlefield. Uh, they capture 200 guys at Blanay and the, the war diary of the North Shore says most of them, uh, they were captured 200 of them, most of them were found dead drunk. <laughs> so, so they uh, yeah. used their last of their alcohol ration to ease the, ease the, the pain of captivity. So the, the North Shore is an attack, what was called Battery Lindman, and the warm up, the, the flails beat lanes through the minefields, and the tanks of the 10th, uh, the 10th Armored Regiment, so the uh, first is ours, uh, no, sorry, 10th Armored is Fort Gary Horse, come in and uh, uh, support them. At the end of the day, the North Shore uh, gained, gained the, the positions. So then the 7th Brigade is attacking in the middle here uh, at Sangat. They're, they're supported by the 1st Hazars. Uh, and one uh, interesting feature of this battle is, is the, the Sherbrooke Fusilier Regiment had actually been taken away and given to the 1st British Corps. So 2nd yeah. Brigade, Brigade was operating with two out of three uh, of its regiments. So once again, resources taken away. So they move into a town uh, called Coquel with the Winnipeg Rifles. Uh, so by the late of the 25th, they, they had taken, and you can see, sort of see with these, the, the, the sort of a downward slope to the uh, to the water here. Winnipeg's come through and the Regina's capture this ground and move down to, to, to dominate the shoreline. Uh, by the end of the day, they were within striking distance of this inner line of fortifications. The 27th, uh, the forward troops backed off a little to allow another bombing program to take, take place. So 342 Lancasters dropped, 1,700 tons. And then the 7th Brigade moved along, and, and as you can see, moved along the uh, the coast, Fort Fort Lapin, the rabbit, rabbit fort, was yeah. captured uh, uh, on the way into Calais. And uh, Bastion 11, which was one of the, uh, the last parts that were, uh, uh, were, were, were uh, captured. So then... Uh, Fort Newley, which you can see right in the middle, the Winnipeg Rifles attacked that. And this is this is a proper fort. It's like a star fortress. looks like the Citadel in Quebec City. Thick walls and a moat. So it was resisting attack, but when the, uh, they brought up uh, flamethrowers, yeah. once they, uh, they said, warmed the enemy up a little, they <laughs> uh, they, they surrendered, uh, poured out. And so they captured uh, about 250 soldiers in that fort. So... By the 28th now, Schroeder, Schroeder is uh, in a desperate uh, desperate straits. His troops' morale was low. Desertions were, were mounting. And he also had 20,000 civilians in the town. So this is the largest uh, uh, numbers of civilians. And so what he does is he, uh, he offers a, a truce with the Canadians. So we've got to evacuate these civilians out of Calais. Uh, I'd, uh, I want to have a truce. So uh, on the night of the 28th, the... The uh, meet General Spry. Uh, General Spry goes to the meeting place, but Schroeder doesn't show up. Um, but the and his representative from his chief of staff probably came along and said, "Well, we, why don't we declare Calais an open city?" Uh, but 
since they were they were actively defending Calais, Sprite didn't, didn't accept that idea. But they extended the truce for 48 hours. So they said, we'll give you 48 more hours to evacuate. And so by noon on the 30th of September, September was when the, when the truce, was, truce was going to end. And that's when uh, the civil affairs people again, a guy named Colonel J.J. Hurley, who was the senior civil affairs officer, is now they're, they're evacuating the civilians to the south, out the one sort of road out of the town, as many as want to go. I think it's upwards of 8,000 left. Uh, so they, his view is that they're just waiting, evacuate the civilians, and they'll make some sort of show of resistance to satisfy their honor, and then they'll surrender. That's his, his perception of what's going on here. Uh, the civil affairs, uh, say officers taking care of the re re uh, refugees. And then two hours after the uh, expiration of the truce, which is like 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the 30th, the Queen's Own and the Camerons were to make a, a well-supported attack from the east. So you can see that over here. All the Regina rifles are going to drive into the town from the south. Uh, so that's going to be the final battle for Calais. Uh, the, what, it, what happened during this truce, though, is this sort of waiting and, and uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the chance to think about things. It seems to increase the demoralization of the Germans. Yeah. The idea that you know, we're not going to win this. This is just a truce to let the civilians go. So more and more Germans are deserting at this point. And uh, they basically cancel the last bomber attack that was going to support this uh, this attack and they, 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 they have some typhoons and spitfires come in and strafe up the germans uh but the but the camerons on this side the camerons of ottawa report the germans are streaming out of the city to the east they're trying to get away they're being picked up by the, the troops of the east uh the canadian scottish re re resume their advance into the city along the coast and basically there's there's little resistance so at 7 p.m schroeder surrendered to the commanding officer of the of the Camerons, so he came out to the east, and by nine o'clock in the morning on the first, this is on the uh, all resistance had had ceased. So that little pause that they had in the battle sort of gave a chance for the the realization. If you're like, you're sitting in your bunker fighting away and someone's shooting at you, well you'll shoot back. But if you know you're, you're given forty eight hours to think about it and say, what am I really doing here? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, do I really want to die for this bunker in Calais when I can be? You know, be a prisoner and make it make make it home. So they capture uh, 7,500 prisoners. Uh, casualties in the third division were under 300. Yep. With the seventh brigade taking the most, 190 casualties. And uh, once again, though, the port has been painstakingly demolished by the Germans. And it wasn't open until November. Yeah. It basically, it takes about a month to restore these these ports to uh, to operations. Uh, and uh, Calais, once, it, once it's put into operation, it's used as a sort of personnel port, so bringing people back and forth from England. Uh, as you know, it's obviously very close to, to Dover. Yes. <laughs> and it's also used as a train ferry because they can bring rail cars right over and, and link up with the rail, which is what they used to do before the war as well. There was a rail rail ferries that would bring over trains that uh, would then take you to Paris or wherever. So the last phase of the battle is this is, is these... Uh, the, the gun batteries, and I've, I've superimposed, unfortunately, the bill didn't work, but you see the gun batteries that are there at, uh, at Floningzell and uh, Battery Tote at Hanningzell, the uh, Battery Tote and Battery Grocer Kerfurst. You can see the upper one is disguised to look like a house yeah, with a very tall chimney. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's a picture of it firing, and then the, the, the big guns in, in Battery Tote, which is now a museum, yep. which you can uh, go and see. Uh, they actually have a gun. The gun is no longer in the... Uh, casemate, but there's a gun outside that came from somewhere else that was similar to that gun. Yeah. So uh, basically the uh, the attack uh, going uphill into these battles here is a fairly straightforward attack by the Highland Light Infantry and the North Nova Scotia Highlanders. Um, they uh, uh, the, uh, the, they, they basically advance straight up to them and, and they, they, they resist in a cursory way, but then are captured. And there's a story of the guy who's circled there, Lieutenant Colonel Forbes of the North Nova Scotia Hollanders. They had they had, had they had been sitting here for a bit, and they had time to do some recce. And so one of the stories in the North Nova Scotia Hollanders is that Forbes actually walked up to the battery and knocked on the door, yeah. and asked them, asked them how many soldiers were in there, <laughs> which is sort of the, the 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 cookhouse rumor in the North Nova Scotia. It probably didn't happen. 
from makes, that. makes for a good story. So they, uh, they basically, once they brought up Avery's and started lobbing petards at the, the bunkers, the Germans quickly uh, quickly gave up, uh, and that was, that was that. So there were only 42 casualties amongst the two battalions taking these two battles. And they captured, there were 1,600 troops here, though, in mm -hmm. these two batteries. So with 800 troops in each battery. Um, and then uh, General General Spry has a bit of a, because these guns have been shooting back and forth across the channel since 1939 almost. Or 1940, not 1939. Yeah. 1940, 41, whenever they were built. They were probably built in, actually, they were probably built in 42, I would probably. I think it's 42, yeah. yeah when they, they had the major, major uh, construction. And so uh, Spry took a flag from the battery tote and he presented it to the mayor of Dover. <laughs> And so I'm not sure if he still has it, but uh, and as they, yeah, <laughs> still there somewhere. As, as they were standing on the on the on the bunker here, sort of ser uh, serendipitously, they saw a convoy of ships heading into Boulogne. So it was sort of that was sort of this is uh, you know, this is what we were doing this for. So now now our ships have freedom of movement uh, in the channel, and of course, uh, so that's the that's the end of that. The, the, the other thing that happened, of course, was. At the same time as we were clearing the V1 sites, it was another sub sort of subsidiary uh, of this uh, campaign. Because this is behind the area of Calais was where the Arc was, where a lot of the V1 launch sites were. Yep. So they were um, basically rolled up during this uh, this campaign as well. And uh, it was, it was, from then on, it was more V2 than V1. Uh, well, certainly the threat to, to London. Yep. Was still, Antwerp, of course, was still getting hit by uh, V1s right till uh, for quite a while, quite a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, they could re 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 the England or, or, or Britain was only uh, in range of V2s from this point onwards. So that's uh, so that's the story. Uh, so that's the the, 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 the summary. So thirty thousand Germans captured, uh, seventeen hundred losses, killed, wounded, and captured. Uh, three just three destroyed ports captured, the coastal guns and V1 sites. Was it worth it? No, that was it. Was it worth the effort? And that's the. Uh, it's always, it seems to always get asked of the Canadians and in the in the history. And even and Stacy, Stacy, who is uh, has got his views, of, of, but his his is interesting. What he's, he he his comments on this. Mm -hmm. He said on the fourth of September there are basically two choices, from his point of view, it was back Monty to the health, you know, the whole Monty plan, and go with the, the massive divisions to the north, which you can argue whether that was whether that was uh, uh, reasonable option or not but that was or and forget about the channel port just mass the channel ports yeah and, and go for uh go for winning the war quickly or you know mass mass it we don't worry about the channel ports worry about antwerp like put all the effort into antwerp and clearing the shelt don't attack martin garden and use the, the mass of the 21st army group to clear antwerp and the shelt and uh and then go east uh, after that so his his comment is that Eisenhower chose neither of those. He chose to do both, or a little bit of both. Yep. And therefore, things uh, didn't go well. But the uh, to read Terry Cop's articles in Legion magazine, where he describes this battle, and sort of the, the 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 criticism of the Canadian Army here is from people who don't haven't studied the campaign in detail. Yeah. And they just look at you know it took you from it took you set five days to capture Boulogne. Well, yep. you also look, look at the resources in the army. Look at the reduction. They they were down to two divisions in the army basically. Uh, when they were doing this, uh, because everything else had been tossed away and other things, so I think uh, Spry in his first campaign, uh, I think did, did a pretty good job actually of, yep. uh, of orchestrating these battles. And he, he's, he's lucky that he, he has a very experienced set of brigade commanders and senior staff to help him. Yep. Uh, but uh, that's you know, so the next step after this becomes uh, becomes the Scheldt. So, I think that's uh, one, one other. Uh, you know, you know, now, a word from our sponsors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to go and visit these battlefields with Brad and me on the fourth to the thirteenth of October, we're running a tour to uh, to do the Channel Ports and the Scheldt, uh, staying in Bruges. Uh, you know, there's a, 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 an email address there, or the, and uh, I'll send you the details if you're interested. We probably we have a room for about another four or five, four four people or so. Uh, in, in the, the two minivans that we're going to use, and uh, we'll go and take a look at these battlefields in, in detail. They're very, I find they're very interesting battlefields because they're not often visited. Yep. And uh, uh, and especially you know Calais Canadian War Cemetery, which is which is the cemetery that has all of these war dead in it, 
is uh, probably not visited hardly hardly compared to the other Canadian War Cemeteries in, in Belgium, the Netherlands, and France. Probably the, the least visited of, of all of them. So it's a good chance to go and see uh, see the, the boys of the Third Division who are there. Uh, all right. So questions yeah, or comments? Any questions anybody has, uh, fire away. Um, just trying to see if we had any uh, recently here, if I can. Uh, oh, I answered most of these. Uh, Sorry, I'm taking a bit of tangents in the sidebar here. <laughs> As that tends to happen, which is good to yes. see. Yes. Um, uh, well, we, had, uh, we talked about it a little bit, but the nature of these... Uh, Fortress troops. I could be misremembering, but weren't some of them those? What do they call them? Like the stomach battalions and uh, and all of that sort of stuff. There were some. Yeah, the fortress battalions are basically. Uh, they weren't. I don't think they were quite the group like that as yeah. extensively because they're. Uh, but yeah, they were. There were the fortress battalions later on. You know, they, they, they had the milk. The milk the ones who could only have bread and milk because they had ulcers and the ones. Yeah. That, yeah. So. Uh, so they were t tending to group them like that. And these guys here probably had, you know, the fortress battalions that were here at this time were probably ones that had been there for the Long whole time. time, you yeah. know, as part of the garrison of the of the fort. And so, you know, they've been in, they may, may have been in uh, uh, in Calais or Boulogne for for a year, you know, before the battlefield. So right. that, that idea of a garrison life and living in a nice French town and all that sort of thing they maybe made them a little less uh, willing to uh, sell yeah. their lives uh, yeah. dearly. Yep. But uh, but yeah, they 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 they're certainly uh, you know able to able to defend themselves with automatic weapons in fortified positions, but no virtually immobile and uh, and no ability to do things like counterattack and things like that. Yeah. So the Canadians had the liberty of being able to sequence their their fight whenever when they wanted to without having to worry about uh, you know the, the, the typical German immediate counterattacks that you'd have if you were fighting a maneuver. Organization, yes. right. yeah. This one's probably more speculative, but it's an interesting one, yeah, considering uh, the connections. But could extra troops and equipment be better allocated to the shelled or to the ground there limit what could be committed? Uh, well, the, uh, the the big debate about the shelled is, is is if we had pushed north from Antwerp earlier, yeah. uh, if the British had done that in early September and sealed off the Walker and Causeway and the South Beveland. Uh, you know, the upside is you would have been able to perhaps liberate the shelter earlier. The downside is you would have been dealing with a way more German soldiers yep. than we ended up ended up uh, doing. Now, whether the Germans would have been as well prepared or, uh, because I don't think, I can't remember when Hitler declares the shelter as a fortress, but I think right. it's after the 4th of September. I think so. And so uh, whether, that, whether that means anything, but it sort of, it does mean that the, the troops there are going to be Fighting to the to the end, and they're they're not expecting to be relieved. Whereas yep. the fifteenth army is all flowing through there, trying to get across the shelf, going across the Flushing, yep. and then trying to get into the Netherlands. Uh, so uh, so they uh, they did, uh, and, and that's sort of the, the the basis of that decision. Do you just mask all of that and just go yep. straight for the shelf? And right. uh, I think if if Mont Monty really wasn't thinking about the shelf at all. Uh, and so, uh, and, and one of the limitations, the limitations, but the realities of the Canadian Army in the Second World War, in North, we weren't a strategic force. We, we right. weren't deciding on the strategy of the war. We were yeah. executing the strategy and, and planning the operations. So yeah. Kriar really wasn't, uh, you know, it, it's contributing to the grand strategy with Monty and, and uh, with Eisenhower and Churchill and all these. So the fact that Monty desperately believed that by doing Market Garden he could shorten the war without Antwerp uh, meant that Antwerp wasn't going to get the resources until almost until Eisenhower orders him to do it directly. Uh, yeah. He had actually started to shift some resources back. But uh, but yeah, there's the great what if is what if we had cut off uh, and kept going north. And, and part of the challenge is, you know, when, when 11th Armored Division goes into Antwerp, they're, they're at the end of their logistic chain as well. Yeah. You know, they, they have no gas. They have no, you know, they, they, so the idea that they could go north and then fight another battle uh, with the Germans in the in the in the Scheldt is debatable, for sure. Yeah. So we all love to do that. Yeah, not a another one we'll never get an answer for, but people will debate till people stop talking about this one. <laughs> someone mentioned about Dunkirk that you know why was Dunkirk mass? Well, because 
they, yeah. they captured Boulogne and Calais. Dunkirk was a much much smaller port, and so it was decided that uh, with the you know the uh, even before we were attacking Calais, it was sort of said we'll just mask Dunkirk. The terrain allowed for it as well in terms of the ability to, yeah. to isolate it. And so uh, initially the second division does that, but then it's handed off to like the Dutch brigade. And the Czech Brigade, so the Princess Irene Brigade ends up doing most of the, the war, most of the, the task, and, and yep. the Czech Brigade yep. uh, with some artillery to support them. Yep. And they basically you know, hem in the Germans there until the end of the war. Yep. Uh, and they don't have they don't have big coastal batteries at Dunkirk like they do in other places. So the threat from what's inside Dunkirk is very limited. And uh, yeah. they decide right. that at that point. It would have happened after the first of October. Yep. Uh, that the Scheldt is like the number one priority. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think when you talk about this, there's no like tanks. But was there any armor whatsoever in any of these? I, I don't recall. Besides the odd French Renault, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't recall. There's no report of tank on tank action, if you like. Yeah. That I that I could find anywhere in the, the Fort Gary Horse. So the right. Canadian tanks are very much in the infantry support role and. Uh, the, the uh, most Shooting mobile people. forces were evacuating as fast as they could down the coast. Yeah. Uh, this is actually a really good one. Um, was the processing and guarding uh, all those POWs slowing any of this down? Yeah, well, fortunately, the you know the Army has a, a large logistic tail to take care of that for the most part. And, and they have certainly been handling lots of prisoners in Normandy. Um, now they're going, they, once again, as the logistic tale of supplies coming up from the beach. Of course, there's also people going back to the beach, you know, the, the prisoners going back to be shipped off to uh, Scotland or Canada or wherever they ended up. So yeah, there, there was definitely uh, forces, the, the line of communication forces, there were there were thousands of troops in the line of communication forces that that was their job. Yeah. Military police, uh, engineers to build camps. Um, and so uh, it didn't, uh, after the initial capture and initial holding, uh, they were largely handed off to army level troops and uh, yeah. the fighting troops moved on. Yep. Uh, uh, this is an interesting one and I kind of want to add to this question um, from your experiences anyway. So we know, I've had a video on this on the channel about DF and yes, there obviously was some sentimentality. It turns out the Germans pull out before the attack can go in. Um, and then there's the whole, as you already mentioned briefly before, the rigmarole with Monting wanting Creer to be at a meeting, and Creer doesn't say no. He pretends not to get the message, and then it gets responds late and everything like that. And with yeah, so I think there was a rec recognition that Dieppe was important to the Canadians, yeah. and and then uh, and just just like Saint Valery on Co, which is just down the coast, right, uh, where the 51st Highland Division was yeah. uh, surrendered in 1940, uh, it was also given to them to go and liberate Saint Valery on Co. Uh, but to the 51st Highland Division. So there was a certain amount of uh, uh, sentimentality or you, you earned it, so you go back and, and liberate it. <coughs> and so, uh, you know, in certain in Dieppe, until we realized that, uh, that the enemy had uh, abandoned it, we were planning to bomb it and, uh, and yep. go in and actually attack it. So the 8th uh, Recce Regiment there, the 14th uh, Hussars, uh, yep. sort of run, run into Dieppe and realized that the Germans have left and canceled the bombardment. So... Yeah, uh, yeah there, was, there was definitely, a, 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 I think, a, an assumption. Certainly probably the 2nd Division guys were assuming that they would they would get that job yeah. and go in there. Yeah, because I, I want to ask you with your experience in the, in the military and, and working with other other countries. I mean, does that, is that a primary concern or is it always just get this done first? You know, was Kriar in the wrong for doing what he did? No, I think I think I think well, in the Creora case especially, I think he, he uh, there was there's no way from what his perception was, it wasn't going to be an important meeting, and, and yeah. it, it was more important for him as the senior Canadian to be at that right. ceremony. Yeah. Um, and as it turns out, it was exactly the right decision uh, because they didn't really talk about anything that he he couldn't. Yeah. Uh, he probably should have sent his chief of staff to represent him. Uh, uh, at that at that uh, meeting, as as Monty often did himself, you know, we would send uh, Freddie de Ginga and there would go and represent him at meetings. Uh, so, uh, but I think it was he needed to be there on that uh, on that day. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just moving down here. So James is saying, why was the app important? Well, the app was important because of the raid. Yeah, there it is. We lost so many troops there. 
that we wanted to go back and be the ones to to actually liberate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Canadian wise, yeah, because of what happened in August forty two. Sorry, I was just a bit further up. I think that uh, was planning on going both ways. Yeah. Oh yeah. So there's questions about um, was there? This is kind of out of the scope, but about Market Garden and was there a plan to cut off? Vulcan and, and that area uh, and go all the way basically up to the inner sea as it's called. Uh, but well, I, yeah. yeah well, the, the cores on the, the seventh, the eighth core and the 13th core, which were on the flanks of 30th core, were supposed to go up and, you know, and match the advance or, or parallel the advance. Yeah. And the reality was that the terrain is so bad in terms of rivers. Uh, and and bridges and as the further you get to the coast, the wider the rivers get, and yeah. so the ability to move rapidly north, you know, between say you know the the, the Hell's Highway, you know, the, the yeah. Megan line, and the coast going north to south, all the roads go east to west, and so uh, very very challenging to do that. Uh, they, they 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 my understanding is they they did sort of know that the 15th Army was evacuating. Um, but there wasn't a lot they, they thought they could do to stop. Right. Yeah, because I just because I did a video on on um, Market Garden, and, right. and there, there's one person who claimed, or a few people claim, because the inner sea is marked on a planning map, that was therefore an objective. So that just adds up all kinds of questions about you know what the objective is, and then you bring in the shell, and then the tough times. Relatively speaking, that first Canadian Army has through the channel ports, as we discussed, and then obviously into the shell, which we've covered on the channel in many different ways. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's 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 a lot of questions. I don't think we're ever going to get answers to. But uh, Mon certainly, Monty's focus was, was getting across the Rhine, going north, turning right, if you like, turning east, yeah. not going west, and they, uh, under the assumption that if we went up to uh, to the Zyder Z to like Dalian in that area there and cut them off. Yeah. Everything as as eventually happened when the Canadians eventually did that in forty five. Uh, eventually, all those troops would surrender. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge was they had to go through the hunger winter, but uh, yeah, that's oh, it. Yeah. But uh, but the, um, the the focus was very much more on getting into Germany as opposed to uh, uh, clearing yeah. the Netherlands. Yeah, and then getting into the Ruhr. Um, sorry, just, uh, yeah. I mean. Um, yeah, actually, this is an interesting question, Dave. I don't know if you know, but but because there's always the questions about the, the facilities of these ports, right? And even like in Normandy, what they can hold and bring in, and, and all of that stuff. Do you ever come across anything about Rotterdam? Because I know it's obviously doesn't happen that way, but is there yeah. any discussions about that that you've ever come across? Well, I think I mean Rotterdam is very much further north in the Netherlands, so you'd have yeah. to. It's a, you know, Antwerp being in Belgium on the border there, and being the largest port in Europe at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the only challenge is it's, it's an inland port, as we all yes. know in the show. And Rotterdam would have been, uh, it was a big port too, and, and uh, is now, I think, bigger. It's, it's, a, it's an even bigger port. It's huge. But it would have, would have meant a, a strong commitment to go north along the Dutch coast, which, once again, was a, a very, very challenging thing to do. And uh, yes. didn't really have the resources, I think, to, uh, to do that, as well as, uh, you know, keep going into, uh, into, into Germany and the... Uh, the Rhineland and all the other things that happen because you know if if uh, if the Ardennes doesn't happen right. and we're and we're you know Operation Veritable as we know would have happened a lot earlier we would have turned turned west and uh, turned east sorry and headed into uh, into yeah. Germany which was which was always the, the plan the uh, Antwerp once you get Antwerp into operation it's such a huge port yeah. that it basically is meeting the needs of the Allies uh, for the most you know, Antwerp and Boulogne and, and Calais, once they're all up and running, and Le Havre. Le Havre becomes an American port, actually. It's basically yep. used, by the, used by the Americans to bring their stuff in, uh, yep. adding to their, you know, west coast of France, uh, Lorient and uh, those places, Brest. Uh, yep. But uh, once they have that, then they don't really need Rotterdam. Yeah. Um, so it, as a result, it doesn't get liberated until the end of the war. Yeah, yeah, it's the last name with Amsterdam, that whole area. Yeah, so I think that's good. Uh, thanks, Dave. That was uh, extremely thorough in the best way possible, looking <laughs> at uh, all of those ones. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, that's another thing I'm trying to think of how to say it, because it's covered in the official histories and it's, it's covered in the details. And I, because I, when you're talking about Spry, because I just literally went through some of his papers last week, looking at the end of the tail end of Normandy for third div, 
it, it, it's interesting that some of this stuff doesn't quite get the attention. I'm not entirely sure why it doesn't get the attention in, in Canada specifically. I mean, it just, it seems like it would. Cause again, like you said, the story about knocking on the door and there's all kinds of stories right that, right. About the, the fight, you know, the crocodiles and all that stuff. I just thought it would be more interesting for people in that way, but I don't, I'm not really sure. Yeah. I, th I think in the wider allied narrative, it gets sort of overwhelmed by market garden, market garden what's yeah. going on there. And then within the Canadian narrative, you know, the, the Scheldt is such a much bigger, uh, more, yeah. much more important battle. Uh, and that is you know, probably the most important thing that we do in, in the, and the army does in the second world yeah. war. Probably that the preliminaries, you know, that gap in between, it's like the intermission between Normandy and the Scheldt, right? Is the Channel Ports, and and uh, but you know, uh, 7, 1600, 1700 casualties. There's a cemetery with seven, 800 Canadians in it uh, along the way there that, uh, that they had to that paid the price, and uh, I think it, it deserves to it deserves to be uh, remembered. And I think. Yes. Uh, Mark Zulke's book, uh, I think, is probably the best. Probably the best we'll see of a, of a one-volume treatment of the Canadian Probably, book. yeah. Um, it has a lot of good uh, veteran narratives in it and that sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, and then the you know, Cinderella Army, which is Terry Kopp's second yep. volume after Fields of Fire, covers in, 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 and talks more about the strategic challenges and the you know, debates than, than Zulke yes. does. Zulke is much more about the tactical and the personal. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but uh, those two books together, I think, are probably uh, the best until somebody writes a. You know, when I was written a good biography of Spry or like that, right? Uh, yeah, not yet. Yeah. There's a dissertation, but no. Is there? no. Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, that's how I learned about those files, uh, kind of what they sort of contain. But yeah, there's a, a, a dissertation about Spry. It's actually not bad, but I don't know if it's any plans for a book. But, uh, I, I met him in 1989. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah. At uh, 1985, he, he came to General Ralph Hawley Keefler's funeral in Montreal, and I was an usher at the funeral. Uh, I was a local artillery regiment was was dragooned into helping out at the funeral, and so General Spry mm. came to the funeral. And uh, me being an idiotic lieutenant of 20 years old, I didn't really know. So he said, "Do you know who I am?" And I said, "No, sir, I don't." He says, "I'm General Spry." <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> His seat with his, you know, his meter and a half of medals on his chest there and all that. Yeah. And uh, said, uh, yeah, do you know who I am? No. Oh, sorry, sir, I don't. Well, I'm General Spry. And so at that point, I didn't really know who General Spry was either. So uh, yeah. So I went home and opened a bunch of books and, and read about him. But, uh, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, passed away shortly after that. Um, yeah. Right. He's, he's an interesting character. I mean, yeah. He uh, Anyway, he gets a bit of a short shift, but that's, yes. my opinion. But that's for another time. <laughs> Uh, anyway, right. so yeah, so uh, thanks again, Dave. People, uh, I'll link. Uh, well, I've already linked some of it down below, but I can put the email and everything in there for those to check okay. out afterwards for the tour. Uh, and people can always ask me questions if necessary. If I don't have answers, I'll take them to you. But uh, other than that, uh, everyone, thanks for hanging out on Sunday on uh, on some uh, on St. Patrick's Day. So uh, everyone else, enjoy the rest of uh, what's left of your weekend, and uh, see everybody next time. Bye, everyone. Good day.